I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at BPM. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Welcome back to another edition. Before we move forward, this is initially for our Patreon supporters. So thanks to all of you very much for your continued support. It's all helping us grow. And though it's not moving at a pace some of us would hope it would move, we appreciate your patience because... Very soon, you're going to see some of the more, at least, of the initial fruits of your support and your your support for our labor. So thank you very much. And to those of you who are seeing this after the fact, who are not current supporters of us through Patreon, thank you as well for liking, sharing, subscribing, putting this in your socials, commenting, all of those things help us grow as well. If you can, at some point, support us materially, please do click the link in the show description and Find your way to our Patreon at Black Power Media and throw in as little as $2 a month helps and it gets you access to early videos, exclusive videos and other uh, content and rewards already and some more that will be developed and made available soon come. So as I've been saying since the second edition of the myth and propaganda of Black buying power, I've increasingly been looking at how McKinsey and Company involves itself in the process of promoting the mythology. So I've wanted to look a little bit more at who they are and what they do. Now, a proper deep dive into the book I've been using in bits and pieces when McKinsey comes to town is definitely in order. We'll have to get to that at some point. But initially for now, I wanted to look at some of these videos off of their platform, one of which is relatively new, the others a couple of years old, all of which I think helps us better understand this creeping, trickle-down analytical media environment that McKinsey is helping establish that inhibits our ability to properly understand how race, class, and media work and how we might get ourselves out of this conundrum. And it's all very slick and perfectly in tune with what McKinsey has been doing in service of municipalities, corporations, federal governments, intelligence agencies for a long time. Now, with increasing interest, they're turning their lens to Black America as one small piece of a global endeavor, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to start with this initial video before we get to the specifics of Blackness to see how they are approaching the world, diversity, inclusion, so on and so forth. So let's check it out. All right. First up from a video called McKinsey Operations. All of these will be linked in the show description. Let's check this out. Operations is basically about a third of the work that we do as the firm. It's the largest functional practice that we have. It's really the area within the firm where we help our clients actually deliver results in their operations, in their asset intensive industries. There are a number of service lines that we have. The first is capital excellence. The second is service operations. We've also got product development and procurement and manufacturing and supply chain. Operations is really special to me because I get to solve problems that I was on the other end of in my previous career. Uh, And I get to work with people that care about it just as much as I do. Uh, We work hard, but the problems that we're solving are really important to today's world. One of the common misconceptions about McKinsey is that we're a pure strategy consultancy. And all we do is do a bunch of research, make a bunch of excels and make a 400 page PowerPoint presentation that just goes in the shredder. What we actually do is, you know, partner with our clients from the first step in the improvement process, work out what they should do. And that that effectively a strategy, but then we'll be with them all the way through the implementation process. And then we help them tackle the next thing. It's not a transactional relationship we have with our clients. It's a partnership that lasts for years and years and years. What makes McKinsey Opera? So obviously they're trying to sell themselves and market themselves as not just transactional and we're here with you to the end. A lot of corp, a lot of businesses approach it this way and it makes sense. But again, for our purposes, I, I just wonder how they see what we're going to look at in a moment, their involvement in discussions of of race, representation, redistribution, material inequality. Is that part of their operations plan? Like which one of the, like, how do they fold all of that? But the point is, it is being folded into their larger global mission, which is being given a very nice presentation in these, in these videos, very well produced, sound great, look great. Operation very special to me is the fact that although it's a 
European wide practice with, you know, more than 600 consultants and a lot of staffing opportunities in Europe and even all over the world. Um, yet it still feels like a very small and tight community. The level of support and careness that I got from the operation practice was a key for my personal growth at the firm. For me, operation is mostly about the people, I have to say. So when I say people, I truly think there is a community feeling uh, within McKinsey Operations. We get to meet a lot of people through projects for clients, but also practice development or any other topics. We also do have the occasion to meet and to gather around more fun events. I've started building my community with a specific subgroup. Which and it sounds like a like a multi-level marketing thing where each of these folks goes out to, goes out and has their little client group and their little base and, 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 and through it. And it is probably how a, a similar model of how they work. You take ideas about how to exploit, extract, manipulate, and you create leaderships who have their own constituencies all over the world, all the ways we're going to see down to to uh, black people here in the U.S. Which is like the women in operations group, which is, I think, the biggest support go. network that we have. So it's a group where you can support group talk about content if, if you need. But it's really also like, how do I make my own McKinsey? How, how do I progress? How do I develop? Who do I talk to? It's just good to have the support support system and um, which you may not have everywhere. What surprises me the most at McKinsey Operation is the number of experts that we have on everything really. So for every kind of topic, you will always find someone to jump in and uh, be ready to support either internally or for a client on a very specific expertise. And that truly amazed me every time I'm still confronted to it. As a consultant working at McKinsey, you're really the, the tip of a very big iceberg. You're the person speaking to the clients every day, working out what their problem is and how to solve it. But you've got this massive resource behind you of research specialists, you know, really, really great experts who've worked in the field for 30 years and know the ins and outs of everything. And you've got all that behind you. And that's. And underneath that, that tip of the iceberg, remember all of these people are the ones, if you notice, if you start to pay attention to top politicians, pundits, econ economic analysts, so on and so forth. Many of them come through McKinsey. They take these consultants positions. They get placed all over the world. They learn the ropes. They learn how to how the thing works, and then they go to their final destination. And that's right. There is a huge iceberg of manipulation and extraction and exploitation underneath the. That that's that. it's a real pleasure to be able to bring that all through you as a conduit to the client and, and solve problems like that. So a typical week for me is a week where I spend at least two days on the ground with the clients, meaning collocating uh, at the co client uh, with my teams. <laughs> um, and the rest of the time, I am either in the Paris office uh, or working from home. Um, and this gives me a lot of flexibility. I never, I never spend a day without interacting with the clients. So we are always connected uh, virtually with the teams as well, because this is the best way for all of us also to grow and continue developing. But um, this way of working, which is hybrid, is also a good opportunity for us to create a better balance also. Before I joined McKinsey, I wasn't certain that I would fit in. I'm from Manchester originally. I thought I would feel very left out in the office, that I might be the only northerner here. I couldn't have been more wrong. I found people just like me. I found people from all diverse backgrounds. Everybody supports each other. It's a real community. So the great thing about McKinsey is it's not just intelligent, highly intelligent people. It's different perspectives and people who can learn, people who yeah. can adapt. So different backgrounds, different experience, the more diverse the background, actually the better, because the problems we are solving are becoming more and more complex. And we need that variety to think differently. I would say McKinsey is possibly the most unique place that I have ever worked. It is demanding and it is rewarding in equal measures. There are weeks when things are very quiet. There are weeks when it is incredibly busy and you end up on a Friday thinking, what happened to the week? But it is the most rewarding and just interesting. The sheer variety of problems, the things that are solved by McKinsey are just incredible. So if you want anything but a mundane life, join McKinsey. Exactly. Their approach to diversity is very neo-colonial. How does the diversity of our empire help us better understand and manipulate and reflect back to them, those in, that we've colonized, a version of the world that they will accept, that benefits us, that they were less likely to rebel against? All right, so now let's move forward with McKinsey's look at 
Black representation in film and TV, key facts. A short video here that if we look at it in terms of where we just left off, this is the operations plan whittled down or focused on the expand out of all the expansive work they do this is them now focused on the my minutia of race and representation here in the united states with the idea again that they have as they've just explained they have an endless reservoir of resources 600 plus employees all around the world consultants who can help put them put this together and here's we're going to see these next few videos they've clearly found their black crew of McKinsey propaganda producers who will help in an indirect way create an environment where we at the other end are less likely to interpret the world as we would need to and less likely to hear the analyses coming out of spaces like this because they're being negated in advance by what we're seeing here. My bad, everybody. A quick note from the editing bay and one point I left out, of course, right here is that there is, of course, a small percentage of black misleadership class representatives who become the spokespeople for this kind of argument in politics because, of course, they are the ones that receive that small increase or that relative increase. They're the ones whose businesses, in this case, television programs, movies, et cetera, get produced. Their series get produced. They make a little bit of money. Their celebrity is recirculated. And then they join the chorus of folks encouraging us ever more to the right, ever more liberal with our analysis and responses to the worsening and ongoing conditions that we continue to struggle against. 87% of TV executives and 92% of film executives are white. Less than 6% of Hollywood film writers, directors, and producers are Black. The industry stands to gain an additional $10 billion in annual revenues, about 7% more each year from addressing racial inequities. Films. There you go. $10 billion more a year goes to the economy, to the industry, to those who own it, not to Black people. With two or more Black professionals in off-screen creative roles, producer, writer, or director, for example, receive significantly lower production budgets, more than 40% less than other films. Race agnostic films get three times the average production budget of race-related films. In 2019, the top films with Black... Because white audiences are not interested in films about race unless they're done in a very particular way. So, of course, they're going to get less of a budget. Black leads were distributed in fewer international markets on average. Yet, they earned nearly the same global box office as films with white leads and earned more than those films on a per-market basis. So again, of course, one of the problems that these analyses fail to account for is that the goal with major media is not only, if not, and I would argue not even uh, as a primary concern, is not financial, it's not, it's not profit. The goal of profit is secondary to the political content to the propaganda, to the psychological warfare, to the ordering of dominant narratives globally as much as possible. And of course, as we pointed out here before, Will Smith pointed that out years ago when he was talking about the film Hitch and why they paired him with a light-skinned Latina as a romantic love interest. Because as he pointed out accurately, international audiences are less interested in seeing a romantic love story between two black people. And the South, as he pointed out here in the United States, would not want to see him paired with a white woman. So to do the domestic, they get rid of the white woman. To do the international, they get rid of the black woman. Again, what do primarily white affluent, affluent audiences want to see and what will they pay for? That is what we're getting. And that's why these videos are constructed to target white affluent corporate owners and investors to see how we can address problems of representation and inequality, but do so in a way that increases problems of representation and inequality. All right, let's keep it going here with the next one up. Again, all of these will be linked in the show description. This one is Black Representation in Film and TV, The Path Forward in Hollywood. Break insider biases around hiring, mentorship, and advancement. There are financial, network, and geographical biases that are often perpetuated in Hollywood. 
which so the, what McKinsey has done here is update John H. Johnson's selling the Negro inadvertently drive exclusion while scholarships and funding helps to create additional resources for certain candidates. It would also be important to think about removing the types of practices that make separate funding or programs necessary. Similarly, companies should commit to consistent and transparent guidelines for hiring so that criteria does not change by candidate. Ensure that key decision making and gatekeeping roles are racially representative and are accountable for creating more inclusive experiences. Making it less likely for anyone to aspire to achieve 40 percent racial and ethnic representation, including 13 percent black across levels, roles, pitches and represented towns yes, diverse. and make those goals public to hold yourself accountable. Dedicate funding for increasing diverse content, allowing for creative freedom and incorporate into the yearly budgeting process. Scrub existing green lighting process for unintended bias and introduce new mechanisms, protocols and evaluation metrics to ensure diverse stories are more fairly assessed. Commit to collective action enabled by the commissioning of an independent entity. It will be critical to drive collective action via an independent entity that can create best practices, scale capabilities, and maintain arm's length advocacy. With billions of dollars at stake, these five actions are a starting point to help to guide the roadmap for strengthening diversity, equity, and inclusion in film and TV. It's billions of dollars at stake of ad revenue and consumer sales, not for redistribution, not to address inequality, but to capture through independent hiring of black companies ostensibly, whose job it would be to advise McKinsey on how to advise their clients to diversify their content and their staff and their green lighting process. Again, not to change the content, not to create new narratives in, 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 a, in, in a way that would change change the material reality, but the, to create new diverse narratives that would retell the same old colonialist, white supremacist, capitalist story. This is neo-colonialism at its best, brightest, and its most 21st century. Okay, one more here. Black representation in film and TV, a screenwriter's perspective on Hollywood. Again, all of these two years old, very few views. Oddly, interestingly, and all of them linked in the show description. So you can, if you feel that you want to see them unfettered by my intervention, you could do so and enjoy them uh, as much as you like. But let's let's see what this one has to say. It reads here at the bottom: the following are reenactments of interviews from Black industry professionals. Historically, straight white men have been able to write whatever they want. There is this assumption that they set the standard of what good storytelling is, and we still see that today, such that when someone who is not a straight white man does it, they are surprised. So there's no need to find writers from any other background if you think that's the case. Even though I was staff writing on a popular, well-received show, it was still tough to find an agent. They never had to stretch to see themselves in other people or spaces, so they'll have a harder time representing people they don't personally relate to. When pitching content, there's a perception. By the way, this is exactly what you read in the literature around why, why black businesses and black individuals don't do well with achieving and retaining investment in venture capital. They don't have the relationships with the banks. They don't have the relationships with this or that sector of the economy and this or that investment group or advertising base perception that black people can only write trauma that's blatantly racist most and again this also misrepresents and misunderstands what the function and purpose of media are in any society particularly one in the settler colonial capitalist white supremacist society but media are not here to do anything other than bring about diverse ways of telling the same story to manipulate people in a very tailored way to ex colonial experience as it is being imposed. Most production companies are not predominantly black, nor are they looking for black crews. The predominance of all white production companies flows through the entire value chain accordingly. I was one of few women and definitely few black women there, period, let alone in leadership. So there was no one to look up to. You learn to try not to take up too much space and only speak hmm. when you have something important to say. 
but then peers and others behind you get promoted ahead of you, even when you are bringing more in. Many former studio execs get production deals as independent producers affiliated with the studio. So whatever inequity is prevalent in the studios will carry over to the mix of producers. Buyers know who they want to buy from, and they mm. buy from the same producers over and over. They never want to buy from people who are unfamiliar. Even when you have a first look overall deal with someone new, same thing in banking. You still won't produce the projects that the talent brings for the same reason. So then you get fewer different people. Well, good people, there you have it. A quick look at how McKinsey is looking to shape the national and global discussion of inequality in a very neo-colonial way. It just all has that that feel of don't organize, don't achieve political power. So there'll be much more. We'll do some more of these. There's more of these videos I'm finding from McKinsey's catalog and I'd like to bring to our platform. And as a way to, again, just to initially thank our patrons, thank you very much. We're going to rock out to you as we close on this special edition. So thank you once again to those who will see this after our patrons. Thanks to you as well. Welcome to the platform. Please do like, share, subscribe, and consider becoming a patron at our Patreon at Black Power Media. As Fred Hampton used to say, to you we say peace, only if you're willing to fight for it. Catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like and throughout the BPM platform. Thanks again, everybody. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Scooter, you don't want to get this for the night, baby. Let's go, Sam. It's party time. Let's go. Let's go to work, man. Now here we go.